um, this this month's uh, monthly outreach um, lecture. Uh, my name is Zach. I work within the uh, outreach team at BSMS. Um, uh, thank you for, for signing up and I hope that you find this month's uh, lecture really interesting. Um, so I'm joined uh, today by um, Alice Tunks, uh, a second year uh, PhD researcher based within BSMS's um, primary care uh, and public health department. Um, so before we get started on uh, tonight's lecture, just a couple of little uh, disclaimers before we get started. Um, uh, this lecture is recorded um, and we will circulate the recording to you um, after the lecture. Um, so we'll take a, an attendee list and those that have come along, um, we will circulate the, the, the recording to you. Um, this will be about a, a week or so um, after uh, the lecture, just because we do have to go through that and edit it and caption it, etc. Um, so don't worry if you don't get that immediately, it will will make its way to you. Um, there will be some time as well after, after um, Alice's lecture uh, to ask some questions. Uh, the best way to do this is if you pop them in the Q&A function um, on Zoom. So that should just be at the bottom of your screen. You should just be able to pop those in as a, a Q&A. Um, I may answer some as we go along if they're not strictly related uh, to the topic for tonight but otherwise we'll, we'll collect them up at the end and, and ask uh, those to Alice so don't worry if we don't immediately answer your question we'll save those until after we finished uh, tonight's lecture okay in which case um, I will hand over uh, to you Alice um, yes over to you thank you very much for that uh, I'm going to share and hopefully you're all able to see that Zach could you just give me a Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. I can see that. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, thank you all for coming along today. Uh, my name is Alice. I'm a, a PhD researcher at Brighton Sussex Medical School, as Zach said, within the Primary Care and Public Health Department. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of talk to you today a bit about kind of my journey to get where I am to today um, and kind of how I got into medical research and then also to talk you through a project that I'm working on at the moment which is is briefly uh, the kind of very succinct title of access to services for perinatal OCD and it's a work in progress this is a study I'm doing at the moment um, and is, is still going on uh, so yeah I'll talk you through that and hopefully it'll be of interest to you so uh, just a little bit about my background so I uh, started off at Cardiff University uh, back in when, oh gosh 2014 I think um and so I always knew I wanted to go into psychology and mental health has always been a massive interest of mine um and I went to Cardiff uh, to do a BSc in psychology and I thought that I wanted to go into clinical psychology and do a clinical doctorate uh, but when I was at Cardiff I basically fell in love with research and I uh, realized how brilliant it was. And I went, went to Cardiff and I also did a, a placement year over in Germany, uh, at a, a research institute over there. Um, and I kind of realized how important research is, especially medical research, um, kind of providing the evidence base that we then practice medicine um, on. Uh, and I really enjoy kind of the way that research is, is structured. Um, it's very kind of project based. So you kind of look at lots of different topics. So you're able to kind of, satisfy a lot of different interests and you're able to kind of move around so my kind of uh, dissertations throughout uh, my kind of research career so far have been quite different and I've still got kind of many many other areas I'd like to look at um, so that's kind of yeah what happened at Cardiff is, is I absolutely fell in love with research so then I went to Manchester where rather than doing an MSc I did an MRes um, also in psychology so rather than kind of developing maybe certain uh, other content skills I actually started to develop more research skills so um, and that was really where I started to develop an interest in qualitative research um, and so kind of starting to really understand that I guess the texture of experiences of, of those um, within kind of the medical world and uh, of, of patients and also during this time I kind of started to develop an interest in a method called co-production which is basically working with those who are from the the, the population that you are in researching um, and, and working with them to do the research in order to kind of uh, enhance its, its kind of effectiveness and its credibility um, and, and kind of yeah how acceptable it is. And then from there I then came to BSMS uh, in 2020 uh, and that was where I started to obviously then really get into medical research so uh, I'm based within the primary care department um, and that's really where my focus is so 
focusing on how people actually get to services um, and how kind of what happens when they initially interact with services and how people can get the support that they actually really need. Um, so yes, yeah, so overall, my kind of journey moved from, you know, when I was younger and, and a teenager, I really wanted to be in the kind of the treatment side of things. Um, and then over time, I kind of developed this interest in, uh, in research and really looking at how we actually get to treatment. So kind of that process before getting into the room, maybe where you're having talking therapy, how you actually get to that point. So uh, I'm just going to do a few questions. So if everyone, uh, if you've got a smartphone, um, if you can use the QR code, hopefully it will work for you. Um, and if not, if you can maybe open up another window um, and your computer and then if you go to menti.com and then type in the code, which is 98477444. Uh, and there's four different questions. So if you uh, just want to have a couple of minutes to click through and then I'll have a look at the results for that in a moment move on to hopefully you can now see this screen yes oh lovely so we've got four student responses wow uh so uh, what does perinatal mean and everybody is saying during the time during and after pregnancy uh which is correct well done everybody so yeah so um the time period that i look at and what i research is is during and after pregnancy so lots of people um or it's quite common to experience mental health problems during and after pregnancy because it's obviously a really um challenging time everything's sort of changing in in your life um so yeah it's that's kind of the topic that i'm looking at so next question is let me go over who doesn't work within primary care is it a gp is it a surgeon a midwife a health visitor or a psychological well-being practitioner so the majority of people here have said surgeon which is correct so so primary care is kind of i guess the the front line of of um support and, and services which are offered within the NHS. So GP is what you typically consider uh, as being part of primary care, but obviously within perinatal populations, you have midwives and health visitors who are kind of interacting with new parents and, and soon to be parents. And then also I put psychological wellbeing practitioner in there because that is who works within the IAP services. So the increasing access to psychological treatment services, um, which was an initiative started in 2008. Um, and they kind of, uh, offer kind of different intensity levels of uh, evidence-based psychological treatment or talking therapies um yeah and so that but surgeons obviously as i'm sure you're aware are kind of uh, in hospitals doing surgeries and that is kind of more later down the line within care so uh, let me move on to this one so what could be seen as an OCD symptom? So concerns around contamination means washing hands repeatedly. Concerns around pushing uh, someone in front of a train means avoiding train stations. Concerns around profanities meaning uh, means avoiding busy public places. Concerns around upsetting God means repeating praise the Lord in your head. And either options one or four or all options. So we'll see what everybody is doing here. So most people are going for all options, which is in fact correct. Uh, lovely. Everybody's so clued up on this topic already. Um, maybe someone else can do the presentation for me. Uh, so yeah, so I'll come on a lot to what OCD symptoms are looking like. But if you look at all of these four examples, there's some sort of intrusive thought. So some sort of um, kind of unwanted thought or image coming into somebody's head and then some sort of compulsion to so the C and OCD. So something that someone's doing, either avoiding or checking or, or doing something in order to avoid that thought um, or intrusive image coming true. So lovely. And I'll just go on to the last one. So what's the benefits of qualitative research? Is it the types of questions it answers? Is it its subjectivity? Or is it that there are none? Qualitative research does not have any benefits. So we seem to have a bit of a mix here between the types of questions it answers and its subjectivity. Oh, no, the types of questions it answers seem to be winning now. Uh, so it's in, well, I guess uh, <laughs> it's debatable to a certain extent. I would say that the, the correct answer is the types of questions it answers. So the way that I view qualitative research is um, that you're just basically answering different questions. You're looking at a phenomenon from a different standpoint. Um, and it's, its benefit is definitely to an extent its subjectivity in that you are 
different uh, kind of, I guess, approaches in qualitative research kind of uh, use um, subjectivity and reflexivity to its advantage. Um, but that will go, that's a whole other rabbit hole for a whole other lecture. Um, but I see kind of quantitative, you know, you've got your phenomena um, and you kind of view it from one standpoint, but actually quite a lot of that, that quite a lot of the phenomena is, is kind of left in the dark and in the shadow. And then qualitative can view something from another perspective. And then you can shed a bit more light on things. Um, and also, I should probably just say, so qualitative um, is more looking at essentially words. So things like interviews, um, observations, focus groups, um, and maybe document analysis. And then quantitative essentially is looking at words. Um, so, yes, data in terms of, yeah, maybe it's surveys, maybe it's um, reaction times, maybe it's, yeah, lots of different numbers. So those are the four little questions. Thank you very much. Hopefully that was Okay for everyone, and now we'll go back to the actual uh, presentation, and I'm going to talk you through some things about perinatal OCD. So this study, um, and my, my PhD as a whole, is called the Open Door Project, and so it's a qualitative study looking at barriers and facilitators, so barriers and facilitators being what helps and hinders us from, um, to, from accessing psychological treatment, so getting to talking therapy, for perinatal obsessive compulsive disorder uh, and so this is what I'm obviously based at BSMS and it's also funded by the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration for Kent, Surrey and Sussex so uh, that that is abbreviated into the ARC, the ARC um, and so what's really great about the ARC is that it's applied research so um, there's a real focus there that on rather than maybe doing research and being like oh this is Cool, we found this out. Uh, the focus is really what can we actually do with that? So that really obviously fits well within medical research. We find something out, we find, you know, that the, these are the barriers and facilitators to accessing services. Okay, what do we do with them? And how actually can we implement that and, and kind of make a difference really? And that's a huge draw for me to, to research, medical research, and that's ultimately kind of what I want. So that's uh yeah, applied research is, is really great. So uh, some things about perinatal OCD, and I'm going to take a bit of time just to explain a bit about it because it's a really kind of not known about thing, basically. Um, so as you know from the questions just then, perinatal is uh, during pregnancy and the year afterwards. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of postnatal depression or the baby blues, as it's sometimes called. And I'm sure all of you are aware of what, what depression is. Um, and so postnatal depression is pretty well understood. Um, it's pretty well uh, recognise and people generally tend to be quite aware of it but actually there's quite a lot of different mental health problems that can happen during the perinatal period um, and, and those tend to be less well understood one of which is perinatal OCD. So what exactly is OCD? So it's essentially consisting of, of intrusive thoughts or, or obsessions and then compulsions. And so intrusive thoughts are very, very common. 90% of the general population um, experience them. you know, I experience them every single day. Uh, the kind of classic ones are, you know, if you're chopping up some vegetables for dinner and you have a knife in your hand and you think, oh, I could chop off my finger right now. That's an intrusive thought. It's not something you intend to do. It's not something you want to do. It just pops into your head and then you kind of let it go. Or another one is sometimes, you know, if you're stood at a train station, you may think, oh, I could just jump in front of that train. You think, I don't want to jump in front of that train, but it's an intrusive thought. It just happens. Um, and yeah, they're incredibly common. But when it kind of then develops into perinatal um, or into OCD is, is when those intrusive thoughts cause a lot of distress, a lot of concern. Um, and I'll come on to maybe a little bit more about that. But, but basically, then they result in compulsion. So they result in some sort of behaviour or mental act. Um, so the classic of, of cleaning um, that a lot of people will, will know about um, in order to kind of stop whatever that intrusive thought is of coming true. So, yeah, it's made up of these two components. In terms of in the perinatal period when OCD occurs, um, it's not particularly well known. It could be anywhere from one in 50 to one in five new parents or, or prospective parents experience it. Um, so those, those uh, numbers are really quite unknown. Um, but symptoms, so some, the classic two, or not classic, the most common uh, two different types is, so intrusions around harm coming to the child, either deliberately harming the child or accidentally harming the child. And then that means that the uh, parent will either avoid or um, keep on checking on the child. 
So that could be, you know, thoughts around maybe dropping your baby down the stairs. And then that means that you completely avoid going upstairs with your baby, for example. And then another obsession, um, which is, is quite common, is around contaminating the child. So uh, harm coming to the child through bacteria or, or whatever it is, uh, and then the child becoming ill. And so that then leads to cleaning and washing compulsion. So maybe in order to make sure that the child isn't becoming um, unwell, you may you know, clean your hands 10 times every hour, for example. And so you may think, well, some of these things are quite sensible. Um, and, you know, you should be wary around a child as a little baby. And so, um, you know, why wouldn't you? Or if you're pregnant, you should be really sensible and, and not do things that are potentially going to harm your child. But really where it becomes perinatal OCD is kind of when it's uh, the interpretation of the thoughts, but also um, the amount of time that you're spending to it. So on average, people with perinatal OCD will spend about 9.6 hours a day. Um, influenced by these symptoms so that's obviously a huge huge part of your day um, and it really impacts kind of your social life your work life your kind of confidence um, and, and all of your relationships maybe with your partner or with your friends and family so that's a little bit about hopefully that kind of explains what perinatal OCD can look like in terms of where does it come from so it could be biological uh, biological research is really in its infancy at the moment um, and Understandably, it's, it's kind of something that, that is considered lots of changes when you are uh, pregnant and, and go through childbirth. Um, but actually, some research suggests that non-birth parents um, experience symptoms and, and experience perinatal OCD at similar rates to birth parents. So that suggests maybe something else is going on there. And possibly that it's about the transition into parenthood. So obviously, when somebody becomes a parent, it's huge. It's life changing. Nothing's ever going to be the same again. Your identity changes, your responsibility changes, your whole kind of world shifts. And so that's a massive thing and makes people very vulnerable to mental health problems developing. Um, and then that leads maybe onto uh, the cognitive behavioural model. So that is the model which is quite prominent within perinatal OCD for why uh, people may be predisposed to develop it. Um, and that is, in, in a nutshell, is, is people who are predisposed will view the thoughts, the intrusive thoughts that come into the head and essentially give weight to them, um, overstate the importance of them and misinterpret them as potentially being able to come true and so kind of see that see them as something which yeah could come true and that they have control over and that they need to do something about in order for that not to happen and so it's all about the interpretation of those thoughts and that's kind of where the, the cognitive behavioral model it comes in so that kind of tells you about what perinatal OCD is and, and maybe where it comes from, but can we can we treat it? Uh, basically, yes, there is effective treatments known. So uh, medication, uh, specifically antidepressants or um, SSRIs um, are, are used and are found to be effective. But some parents will be a bit resistant to that because if they are pregnant or breastfeeding, it can sometimes um, certain types of, of antidepressants can then pass on to the child. So parents can sometimes be resistant. However, the first line of response um, I, in an ideal world is talking therapy so specifically cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure response prevention which is is a type of cbt um which yeah, is found to be really effective um in in perinatal populations so we know that there is actually effective treatment we kind of start we can understand what exactly it is so where exactly does this project come in so we really look at where this population actually interacts then with primary care so those perinatal populations um have a lot of interactions with primary care services so you know they may go see their gp quite a lot they'll have regular visits from the midwives and the health visitors throughout pregnancy and then um in the first few months of, or the first year of their child's life so there's lots of interactions um, and a lot of opportunity for primary care services to um, notice and pick up on perinatal ocd symptoms However, during these interactions, um, there's quite often misdiagnosis or misrecognition uh, by healthcare professionals. So if a parent kind of says something to them, then, then sometimes it can be misrecognised as being a postnatal depression, because that's the thing that everybody kind of sees and thinks about. Uh, and so that maybe that people could be offered the wrong treatment and the wrong support because it, it's being seen as depression 
when it's actually OCD. And then also um, it can be mis misinterpreted. So parents uh, could disclose to a healthcare professional um you know I've, I've had thoughts about throwing my baby down the stairs you know I don't want to do it but, but you know I've thought about it and then I kind of have to do these things and I never take my child upstairs because I'm, I'm concerned about doing it but if healthcare professionals aren't aware of OCD and what exactly it looks like they can then think oh gosh this child is in danger and then contact social services and maybe remove the child from the care of that parent and so it's really really important for healthcare professionals to understand what it is that this looks like and, you know, it's quite nuanced and you really need to kind of listen to what a parent's saying and what their intentions are to, to be able to understand what's going on there. So that's where there's a real need for training and a real need um, for kind of routine inquiry, which means kind of regularly at certain intervals within the perinatal period asking about this. So that's kind of one part of how primary care is really important another part is the the relationship with your healthcare professional within primary care is incredibly important so um having a really positive relationship with your healthcare professional is is good because it it allows disclosure so telling somebody about your experiences and your symptoms um, comes with trust and it also comes with time so uh, that's where continuity of care comes in, which means kind of repeatedly seeing the same healthcare professional over and over. So you recognise them, you kind of build a relationship with them. And that's really, really important across mental health care. Really, um, this, this relationship is, is incredibly important for, for disclosure of symptoms and feeling comfortable, able to talk about things, really. And that's where on the part of the healthcare professional, there's a real need for appropriate inquiry and response. So, um, as I said, kind of not jumping to the social services route um, and also kind of responding in an appropriate way. So, you know, not judging people and making people feel, feel comfortable and able to talk about things. Then just a final element that's kind of important to, to understand in terms of this project is, is I'll kind of mention access. And so what exactly does access mean? And that's that's kind of a, a massive question, really. Uh, and so access to services. So when I'm talking about barriers and facilitators, so what helps and hinders accessing psychological treatment, accessing um, can be a huge range of things. So it's everything from the point of feeling like oh I'm, I actually am experiencing certain kind of thoughts and, and symptoms maybe and thinking that they are symptoms and maybe this is something I could get support for then to kind of knowing where you could go to get support so do you go to a GP do you go to your midwife do you go to uh, a charity where exactly can you go then uh you know making an appointment with them so if you're making an appointment with your gp is it an online service that's really difficult to use or are you on the phone on hold for 20 minutes or half an hour and it's really really difficult to get an appointment is the receptionist really really rude to you um and all of these things and then in the interaction those initial interactions with services so uh yeah where the relationship comes in so are they kind of positive do you feel like comfortable around them or do they make you feel quite uncomfortable uh, and then actually getting to the treatment so if you go to then cbt is it good is it appropriate or or is it kind of not not right for you uh, and then do you kind of feel better as a result so what it means to access and this kind of i think of it as like a timeline um, and this process that people go through it's actually huge um, and so i'm kind of looking in the earlier stages so how exactly do people get to services and accessing healthcare as a human right, you know, regardless of your race, your culture, your religion, whatever it is, accessing it as a human right. And there's lots of different things um, which we call barriers which stop us from actually getting there. Um, so, you know, for example, stigma is a huge one, obviously, within mental health care um, or yeah, the old kind of understanding and things like that. Uh, so that's kind of the, the background and the understanding. So I'm just going to close my light, my window because the sun, it was raining just now. And now it's really, really sunny. There we go. That's a bit better. I can see. Um, so, uh, so that's some background around uh, perinatal OCD and maybe how services can kind of, or, or do interact with uh, this population. Now, just a comment on co-production, which I mentioned very briefly earlier. So co-production has kind of started to develop a lot more in the last kind of 20 years or so. Um, 
and it's essentially working with stakeholders um, to do research and so do do research. So stakeholders can is basically anyone who's involved within the topic that you're looking at. So that could be different healthcare professionals, it could be service users or patients, it could be their, their friends and family, it could be charities and community organisations which work around this topic. And so within medical research, we very often use the term experts by experience or EBEs. Um, and so that is uh, individuals who have experienced the kind of mental health problem or physical health problem themselves. And through going through that and, and uh, experiencing that, they are therefore experts in this topic. And so they can offer really kind of interesting perspectives and, and uh, different things which, which researchers and other people maybe can't, uh, can't don't, don't understand or, or can't really uh, see. So there's a real benefit from, from including uh, these groups within research. Um, and the, the way that you do that is based on certain principles. So the idea of sharing power and valuing other people's knowledge. So if you're in a room with a group of experts by experience and you're talking about how to recruit participants, for example, uh, which, which is something that I've been doing. And so I've, I've had uh, five experts by experience with five mums who've experienced perinatal OCD involved in my research. So we'll talk about recruitment and we'll say, I'll say, oh, I've got this idea and this is, I think this, this and this, and I've made this poster. And then we discuss it and they say, oh, I don't think you should do this or you should really do this or what about this option? And so we kind of share the power, we share the we decision-making and I really value their knowledge and they value mine as well. And we're kind of we have different expertise and we come together to try and develop something um, to the best of our ability by, by combining our knowledge and our expertise. And so this idea of co-production is really important. We, you know, we get better research because of it um, and it kind of takes away from the us versus them or the patient and healthcare professional um, kind of uh, I guess, uh, them being kind of pitted against each other to a certain extent. Um, and it kind of allows everybody to work together to come up with solutions because everybody ultimately wants the best healthcare possible. That's kind of the goal for everybody. And it also gives a lot of power to um, service users. So typically service users feel very disempowered and very kind of um, unable to, to have control over their, the treatment that they're being um, offered. Um, and so it kind of yeah takes away from the unwell patient discourse. So that is uh, basically what co-production is. So yeah, so as I said, I've had uh, my experts by experience involved in um, different elements of, of the process, like recruitment or any participant facing materials. Uh, they've also, some of them have been in control of the social media accounts. Um, three of my experts by experience are going to be conducting interviews uh, with me. So they've been trained up on that and I'll be doing some interviews. And then also will be involved in the analysis of the results. So we're really working together to, to make the research as best as we can. So uh, what exactly is the study? I've given you so much background and now I'm going to very briefly tell you what the study is and a, a few little results. Uh, but hopefully it's been interesting to hear a little bit about the background. I think it's uh, obviously I think it's a good topic. Um, so the aim of this uh, study is to develop an understanding of the barriers and facilitators. So what helps and hinders um, accessing psychological support for perinatal OCD from the service user's perspective. So that includes recognising different symptoms, um, why people access services or why they didn't whether they were happy with treatment and and what they think should maybe change so the sample that we're looking for is those who self-identify as having experienced perinatal OCD um, and that includes those who both have and haven't access to support so um, is it just as important to hear about those who didn't get to services as those who did uh, it needs to be those who live in England and those who experience symptoms during or after 2008, which is uh, because the England has a very specific mental health care system, which includes IAP services, which was developed in 2008. Then uh, we're doing semi-structured interviews. So semi-structured means that we have some set questions, which me and my experts by experience have developed. Um, but it's not set to that. It's not rigidly set. So we can kind of have a conversation and we can flow depending on where the conversation takes us. And the benefit of doing an interview, so qualitative research rather than quantitative. So if you take the interviews versus a survey, 
um, is that the interviews really give us a nuanced understanding and give real texture to those experiences. So a survey could tell us that 90% of, of people with perinatal OCD have experienced stigma when accessing services. And that's really great. That's really important to understand and to know about. Um, yeah, it's, it's lovely. But the way that uh, this project is doing it is is through doing interviews, we can really understand, OK, so you experienced some stigma. Yes, you're, you're one person. But what did that stigma feel like? Kind of where did it come from? How did it influence you? What then happened as a result of that stigma? What did uh, yeah, what did it feel like? And then what can we actually do about it? So maybe what could what could change so that you weren't experiencing that stigma in the future? So yeah, so that's, that's a little bit about the methodology. Then in terms of the preliminary results, so the uh, analysis is being done using thematic analysis, which is where we basically look at, look at the data and what people have said, um, and then look at ideas and patterns that are consistently coming up. So what are parents regularly saying is happening? Uh, so there's four different things which I'll, I'll just kind of touch on here. So one is around when do mum anxieties become perinatal OCD? So, you know, the anxieties that people experience um, are, or, you know, when, when you become a parent, you experience anxiety. It's kind of quite typical. But uh, participants weren't really sure at what point it kind of tipped over into perinatal OCD. So where did your concern around, you know, contamination coming to the child actually then develop into OCD? And there was kind of a suggestion that maybe they thought the healthcare professionals weren't actually sure about that either. And they were sort of told, oh it's okay you're a mum you're meant to be anxious about these things when actually upon reflection they were like no that was that was OCD that I was experiencing the next one is around if you don't fit into postnatal depression box then basically what are we going to do so it was kind of this view that participants had that you know postnatal but they were kind of told by healthcare professionals that postnatal depression, we, you know, we understand it, we, um, we can do something about it, we can recognise it. If you've got postnatal depression, like, we're the people for you. But, you know, if you've got anything else, we're not really sure what we can do. Um, and so kind of if, you know, any anxieties were coming up or OCD symptoms, then it was sort of ignored and seen as not really needing treatment, which is obviously really frustrating for the parents. Then the third theme or idea that kind of came up is the I'll just deal with it. And so um, when somebody kind of becomes a parent, it's obviously somebody else, you know, your baby is your number one priority. And it seems that uh, the parents and our participants um, felt like, well, you know, th this is this is a me problem and I, I'm just going to deal with it. I'm kind of I'm experiencing anxiety and I'm having problems and I don't feel very good. But actually, it's not impacting anybody else. My baby is fine. Uh, my, my family is fine. So and if I go and get support, that's going to take away from them. So I'm just going to deal with it and I'll be all right, really, basically. Um, and so maybe there's some, some things underlying behind that around kind of uh empowerment and understanding um, around what perinatal OCD is and maybe the impacts that it can have. Then the final idea is around is treatment appropriate? So participants kind of suggested that uh, they could they, they had preconceptions about what treatment may include and thought it's actually not worth my time and I don't think I, I want to do it or they got to treatment and then they were like this isn't actually for me this isn't for mums this isn't for the people with perinatal problems um this is this is not not right for me and so maybe that's a problem uh where or a barrier where the type of treatment which is being offered isn't appropriate so those are kind of the initial ideas. As I said, they were still kind of interviewing people and, and still coming up with things from that. But those are some initial ideas in terms of going forward. Uh, so hopefully we're going to interview some more people over the next couple of months and then we'll be analysing and writing up that, uh, those interviews until the end of October. And then uh, that's when the next study of my PhD will begin which is basically where we'll take the uh, results from this study. So we'll have a list of barriers and facilitators and I'll present those to healthcare professionals. And so with the healthcare professionals, we will see, you know, well, which do you think these are a big, which, which ones do you think are barriers and facilitators? And actually, what can we do about them? So that's where the real applied kind of research uh, comes into play. And so 
talking to healthcare professionals you know if if stigma is a problem what can we do about stigma if the uh, what what cbt is offered is a problem what can we do about that and so developing a toolbox which is going to be kind of a, a guide but guideline for sort of best, best practice for how to treat perinatal ocd to then hopefully implement later down the line uh so that was everything uh thank you for listening and uh if you've got any questions feel free to pop them in the box hopefully uh yeah that was interesting and and you can all understand it but thank you very much my email address is also on there if anybody needs it i will Excellent. stop sharing oh thank you very much alice um so yeah looks like we've got a couple of uh, questions um in the the q a uh this first one um from dan says uh, uh so does pocd uh, tend to reduce in severity as the child grows up unlike general ocd or do the intrusive thoughts continue can it develop into a more general ocd so um it's it's a funny one so because of the definition of perinatal being the year up to the year after pregnancy essentially when you go past when your baby when your child becomes a year old you're no longer would be perinatal ocd it would just be ocd um but typically if it's un if it's um untreated it's kind of yeah sometimes it does kind of naturally disappear but it can also just continue um, and develop into more general OCD and also those who before becoming pregnant um, had experienced OCD they are at a higher likelihood to then develop perinatal OCD and it's kind of resurface. Excellent. That's great. Um, so we've got uh, another question here from um, Chiara. In addition to the above, do people with perinatal OCD tend to have uh, tend to have had other forms of OCD earlier in life or is it uh, often restricted to the perinatal period? Yes. So you can just develop perinatal OCD and never have experienced OCD before. Or if you've experienced OCD before, then you're more likely to then experience OCD in the perinatal period. Brilliant. Oh, there's a question about yourself. Um, so what was your journey to start this piece of research? Um, also, and, and this is sort of uh, links on to uh, another question that we've got here. Um, what effects, if any, does uh, POCD have on the child? So I'll start with the the journey to getting to this research. So I guess my interest is incredibly broad. I kind of am interested in, in mental health generally and I guess women is, is a real interest of mine and so I ended up my PhD was very very broad um, and I could look at barriers and facilitators to accessing support across groups um, and I picked BOCD because it's very under-researched and also it's a specialist of my um, or, or one of my supervisors is a specialist in perinatal and another specialist in OCD so it felt like a, a kind of natural kind of direction that it got taken in and and I just find it really really interesting basically um, and the question of oh I forgot what the second half of that question uh, was <laughs> so it was um, can it develop uh, oh no no that's that's not the one uh, what effects um, does POCD have on the child and maybe uh, that'd be a good um, way of linking into this question does the child have a chance of, of getting the traits as well so it can have an effect on the child um, in that, you know, it can affect the kind of the studies looking at the, the bonding that can happen between the parent and the child. And it can re it can influence that. There is limited research on this, really, because perinatal OCD research is really in its infancy. Um, but yeah, it can affect the child and the chance of the child picking up some of the behaviours. Yeah. So accommodation is, is kind of what it's called within OCD when those around the individual can uh, start to kind of pick up on behaviours and kind of do things in order to make the person with OCD feel more comfortable. So maybe if it's a baby, not quite as much because they're, they're a baby, uh, but uh, definitely the, the kind of partners and, and the friends and family of those around can then start to develop kind of OCD-like uh, kind of traits. Excellent. And um, we've got, got some really good questions here. Um, so are the biological explanations of OCD similar to biological explanations of POCD? I will say I'm not 100% sure on that because biological explanations are really not very known. And I'm not really a biological type person, I'm afraid. So I might have to dodge that question. <laughs> That is fair enough. That is fair <laughs> enough. Uh, another question from Dan here. So can fathers also experience POCD? Uh, would this be more likely uh, to be missed by an HCP? 
Yeah, so non-birth parents have similar rates of experiencing POCD. Um, so, you know, that that's the idea of where it's the transition to to parenthood that that's kind of can be a trigger um and yes it would be much more likely for um healthcare professionals to not, yeah not be able to recognize that because i guess they're not the focus when health visitors and midwives are visiting houses they're really focusing on the child then the mother and then the the non-birth parent is is kind of secondary brilliant uh, another question about yourself um so what do you hope to do after your phd so I want to stay within within medical research. So I'm really just uh, I'd really love to be able to pilot this study um, or yeah move into any kind of other access to services and stay within co-producing research because that's really where my my interests lie. So yeah. Another good question here: uh, Does data suggest the chances of developing POCD can be influenced by genetics? <laughs> Uh, this is going to be another non-answer, I'm afraid, in that there is very, very limited research. So, yeah, we're not really sure. OK, another good one. Uh, you mentioned the biological connections to POCD is in its infancy. Uh, are you able to expand a little on this? <laughs> not particularly, I'm afraid. It's just there is very, very little research. There was a uh, systematic review which came out recently, actually this year, um, and yeah, it was basically saying we're not sure biologically what's going on, really, uh, because it's incredibly under under researched. Uh, grand. Well, we did have a question in the chat as well, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that one. Um, because of how many people are unaware of this case, um, how do you expect to inform more people from your research and the data included within it? And how do you view it to be effective amongst others? So in terms of how effective it is, that will be beyond kind of the scope of this project, because that would hopefully come with piloting later on down the line, which I'd love to be able to do. Um, if, so, if somebody wants to fund it, that would be great. Uh, in terms of how exactly to kind of, I guess, raise awareness, that is where the, the co-creation of the toolbox with healthcare professionals will come in. So maybe that includes um, some sort of public health initiative to get parents and prospective parents to be aware of it, to be able to pick up on symptoms. And that could include, you know, a social media campaign. It could include leaflets in, in surgeries and things like that. And then in terms of raising awareness within healthcare professionals, which I think is really, really key, that could include within um, uh, like basically training. So, for example, on Friday, I'm going to perinatal mental health simulation training. So that's where different healthcare professionals are um, doing kind of almost like role play, basically, to to be able to be aware of different health, um, perinatal mental health problems and how to pick up on them, how to respond to them. And so maybe it's that I can work with the, the people that run that, that uh, training to then develop something specifically for perinatal OCD. But the massive challenge is, you know, there's a health visitor crisis at the moment. There's not enough of them and midwives are incredibly overworked and they have very you know limited time with people. So it's how you can get something kind of short and snappy in there for people to pick up on if perinatal OCD is happening. So it's the practicalities that are the real challenge. Excellent. I know that's great. Um, so if the if the parent does not share their intrusive thoughts and compulsions uh, due to fear slash stigma, what other subtle signs can healthcare professionals look for? I guess if there's any kind of other behaviours which appear to be taking up a lot of time. So say if um, you notice that they're not really getting much sleep and then you realise, oh, they're actually checking on the baby every two hours. And they seem to be thinking, no, if it's any less than two hours, then the baby's going to not be alive anymore. Um, and so maybe picking up on things like that, things that just feel quite repetitive and quite extreme. Um, but it would it would require yeah, some certain questions and things that, that people would have to ask about, basically. Yeah, brilliant i think we've got we've got some good ones here um that are sort of linked one in the chat and one that's come through as a question um about sort of uh you know adoptive parents or grandparents that are living um with with the child or uh, is there the possibility of them uh, getting pocd as well um you sort of mentioned a, a, a moment ago about non-birth parents but i wonder how how far that extends i suppose uh, I have never seen any research on this and that would be really really interesting to hear about my guess is that yes it would happen in a similar sense in that it is around kind of the transition to a child kind of being around and the baby being around um, 
so yeah I, I'd guess it was would be a possibility um but yeah there's there's no research as far as I'm aware on that okay we've got another one here um if uh, I wondered if your study included women who accessed further support in mother and baby units yeah so not currently uh because because so because of the kind of across the access timeline and where I'm really focusing which is quite early on so people recognizing symptoms and getting to services rather than maybe the actual how appropriate and effective treatment was um I've not currently um had any participants who, who've been to a mother baby unit and I don't think that going to a mother baby unit is particularly common for perinatal OCD especially in the so I'm based in the southeast of England and there's a really good and effective uh, perinatal specialist uh, mental health team. And so they kind of offer more intensive treatments and that I guess avoid kind of being an inpatient. OK, so uh, what do you mean by preliminary results in the thematic analysis slide? Is it like a pilot study? So that just means we're still collecting data. So I'm still interviewing people. Um, and this is the preliminary results is me. I've, I've transcribed some things. I've started to code things and I've just got some initial thoughts and ideas about themes and what's coming through um, that I just kind of pulled together for you today, really. I know that's great. Thank you very much again, Alice. Um, so are there any demographics more likely to have uh, perinatal OCD, uh, you know, linked to uh, race or class, this person's um, sort of suggested? Uh, again, I'm going to have to do it. There's there's not enough research on this. <laughs> People go and do research from perinatal OCD. Uh, I would guess that, yes, in certain uh, perinatal mental health problems, yeah, that does tend to be the case where different disadvantaged groups will experience um yeah symptoms more and i guess it's the same for, for ocd but um yeah i'm not 100 percent sure on that yeah um, we've got a, a good question here come come from a uh, piece um so how do you help pregnant women in some areas of the world who struggle with these intrusive thoughts and have no clue what perinatal ocd is i i mean that is yeah it's difficult because how, how can you how can you do that really I, I think a lot of it is around kind of awareness raising so a lot of mums that I speak to when they have a name for it and when they kind of be like oh it's OCD that changes everything and this happens with a lot of mental health problems where if you've got a name for it it's so much easier so I guess around yeah getting it to the same kind of um awareness that perinatal depression has um would be great i'd love that one day but <laughs> i don't know i can keep on shouting about it but i don't know how many people are going to listen <laughs> i think uh, this it sort of leads well into into this question i suppose um why do you think not enough research has been done on on pocd i mean uh i guess depression is the kind of the the uh, of all of all mental health problems it's probably a thing that's been looked at a, a lot and the most because it's incredibly common to to experience it i think a lot of people have experienced ocd and not realized so a lot of mums will um be diagnosed with perinatal ocd and then find out oh actually i've experienced this since i was 10 and i actually it was, it was ocd so i think kind of depression is kind of the the cool not cool that's a really but I guess the cool thing to look at uh, and you know other things just kind of get pushed to one side and in terms of specifically why perinatal OCD I think it's because research on women is is very very limited and it's it's a women's problem typically um not to yeah use uninclusive language but yeah typically it's a women's problem and so it gets pushed to the side an awful lot of the time and you know in the preliminary results that I said women just say I'll just deal with it I am fine I'm okay I'll just suck it up and so yeah those problems kind of get pushed to one side an awful lot of the time. Brilliant uh, well I mean not brilliant but a good a good answer <laughs> to that to that question. Um, uh, we've got a, a good question here are there other barriers uh, other than stigma as you previously mentioned in your presentation? Yeah, so stigma, obviously a huge barrier, which we're, I'm sure a lot of us are really aware of within um, mental health problems. Uh, and then I guess awareness is another one which has come up a lot. So so understanding and awareness is is another huge one. Um, so my first study looked at barriers and facilitators to accessing services, but across um, populations, so not just across um, perinatal OCD. So there's some other things I'm trying to remember now, like, 
uh, thinking that referral just won't happen. So in the UK, there's a big thing around wait times. So, you know, I'll just be stuck on a wait list for ages. So actually, why should I even bother going to services? Um, and so I, I kind of can preconceptions of services and what exactly that would mean is, is about another big barrier. And this is, uh, again, this leads quite well into the next question. So are there any support groups um, for, for women with POCD? So, yes, uh, there is a really great organisation called Maternal OCD. So maternal, I guess, is an interchangeable word with perinatal. Uh, and that's run by two experts by experience. Um, and they are really, really great at offering support. Uh, there is also just general OCD organisations who are really great. Um, yeah, and then also there are lots of kind of the OCD community on Twitter is, is a big thing. And so, yeah, lots of support going on there. There's, um, yeah, there's uh, like PND hour, which is postnatal depression hour. So every Wednesday from eight to nine, people use that hashtag and discuss different. And it's not really limited just to, to depression. It's kind of across uh, perinatal populations. Um, good stuff good stuff uh so we've got a good question here i suppose this links to at, at the start of your your presentation you were talking about your route um into to medical research um so so how did you uh you, what what sort of a levels did you study how did you decide to go into that sort of area like initially uh, at, at the very beginning yeah so i knew i wanted to do i was one of those people who knew what they wanted to do stupidly earlier on so i was 13 i went to an open day at a university and i discovered what psychology was and i was like that's incredible i love it so much so yeah so from 13 i knew i wanted to be in mental health um and then i didn't actually do a levels i did the international baccalaureate um which i assume some people are aware of but yeah so in terms of the ib i did oh, standard i did french maths biology higher I did English chemistry psychology and then I also did a maths a level on top of that yes I think that's right that was a very long time ago <laughs> no that's that's fair enough that is fair enough um we've got a question here I'm not entirely sure what they mean maybe maybe you know what they mean uh, could you say that an expert by experience is perhaps more biased I guess bias in terms of what, but I would, I mean, qualitative research generally doesn't believe in bias, essentially. Uh, that's a whole other conversation, but basically, you know, our experiences are incredibly valid and what is real and what is true is is all kind of based on, on what we feel and what we experience. Um, and so, yeah, so somebody could be, my, one of my co-production group could be incredibly, you know, anti-services, anti kind of authority maybe. Um, but, you know, there'll be a reason why they've kind of come to, to believe like that. And um, their perception is, is still really important and valid. And we should still kind of give some weight to it, really. Excellent. Um, we've got a, a good question here from Zara. I suppose this links a little bit to your, you know, the, the group that you've worked with so far. Um, but does does POCD happen more commonly in young parents or is there no age correlation from from what you've seen? So uh, it's. Well, I'm not 100% sure with OCD, but with perinatal mental health problems, it does tend to, they do tend to happen more commonly in younger parents than it does with older. Yeah, I'm not really sure why that happens. Um, yeah, it could be around awareness. It could be around kind of identity. There's, there's lots of different things. Excellent. Um, so we're, we're sort of coming to the end of our of our time for our, for our lecture here. So if you've got any any sort of final questions, do feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to uh, start sharing um, some slides myself uh, just uh, to talk to you about our, our next month's um, lecture. So let me just uh, share that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, next month uh, we will be joined uh, by uh, Dr. Anna Crown, uh, who's going to be doing a, a lecture on uh, hormones and endocrinology. Um, so do do check that out. We will include a link to register for that um, in the email that you get with the attachment for um, for this this session um, after in about a week or two. Um, so, yeah, you can sign up for that. Uh, and the link will also be on our website. So do come along for that one on the 6th of July. Um, and also, if you you're interested in in medicine if you're thinking about studying medicine uh we are hosting our open day um on saturday uh on the university of sussex campus um so do feel free you can sign up for that now on our website if you are 
local to the area uh, or, or want to come and travel and meet us, uh, please do. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about our medicine course if you're thinking of, of studying medicine. We are also hosting some virtual open days as well. Um, so if you if you aren't able to travel, but you're still interested, you can check those out. Um, the information about those, those is on the website as well. Um, so yeah, just my little plug there. Um, if you do have any questions after uh, this talk uh, has finished, if you think of anything else, uh, please do feel free to email us at outreach at bsms.ac.uk. More than happy to um, forward those on to Alice, collect collect those responses and, and um, get those back to you um, as well. Uh, and we'll try and get some sort of resources uh, for, from Alice as well to include in the uh, the mail out with the, with the recording of tonight's lecture um, as well. OK, I think we've got we've got a couple of final questions um, as we reach reach our time. So uh, our first one um, is POCD more likely after having multiple children. Uh, would it be worse than before? If so, um, could you have the POCD over older children as well as a new baby? I'm not really sure on that one. That is a great. I mean, there's been really great questions, everybody. Well done. <laughs> um, I'm not 100% sure on that. I would say, uh, I think with first time parents, it's more common um, than it is with your latter children. Um, however, I know it's like a concern for parents to then have subsequent children if it does kind of happen again. Um, but I guess if you're aware that you may then experience symptoms, you're more likely to kind of recognize them as soon as they pop up and then kind of, I guess, nip it in the bud a little bit more. Excellent. OK, so I think I think that's the end of our questions. So we will we will call um, the end of of, our, uh, of the lecture this month. And thank you very much for coming along, uh, folks. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. We hope to see you um, at uh, one of our future um, lectures. Uh, and thank you very much, Alice, uh, for, for talking this evening. Thank you very much for having me.